Hi, I'm Exo, and this is Exo Dream. Exo Dream is a brand new project that we released about two weeks ago. Uh, Dream itself, and that is with two M's, D E D R E A M M, was uh, designed by Aaron Giles. Uh, you may remember his name or be familiar with his name from MAME, where he was a head programmer there for well over 10 years, if I remember correctly. Uh, at a time, he worked for LucasArts, where he ported games over to the Macintosh system. And at this point, he has decided to go back and create uh, what he calls a bespoke emulator designed specifically for LucasArts games. Now, the first question that uh, you may have is, how does this differ from ScumVM and the while it's a fair question, the answer is they're very different. ScumVM reverse engineers the data files of the game to play them. So it's not using the original engine. Uh, you don't run the executable file. You provide it the data files and it runs them under a new framework. This actually emulates the machine that the game runs on. So more like DOSBox, it's an x86 emulator. You do need the original data files for these games. So overall for preservation, that's better because it's the same files that you would run, excuse me, on an original machine. It also means if websites like GOG, GOG.com can be persuaded or Steam for that matter into using the dream version of these games, then that's better for preservation overall because now they are distributing the original files. Now, Dream also differs from ScumVM in a large way in that it is a much more inclusive LucasArts emulator. Whereas ScumVM primarily focuses on adventure games, as you can see from this list, the very first game is Afterlife. That is a strategy game. And you can see several Indiana Jones games on here that were not released on the, uh, in the original ScumVM because they're not adventure games either. Now, that's not to say they don't have any adventure games. There's plenty of them. Now... Dream, to me, is a love letter to LucasArts. It's, and it's something that Aaron is still working on. Uh, his next release has several more games he's adding to it, including several flight simulators. Um, you know, LucasArts had a string of amazing hits for a while there. Uh, Secret Weapons of the Luftwaffe comes to mind, for example. Battlehawks 1942. Uh, it's amazing to me that they release so many high-quality games across so many genres. Uh, they are arguably one of the best, if not the best, in your opinion, uh, for each opinion, adventure game designer out there. It usually comes down to a debate between LucasArts and Sierra. But they also could compete with Microprose in some ways in their flight sims. Uh, they had pretty good action games out there too. Their strategy games. Afterlife if, could be confused as a Maxis game if you didn't know any better. Uh, just as confusing and just as in-depth <laughs> as something like Sim Earth. Uh, they also had, you know, I wouldn't say Outlaws is Doom, but it's not a bad first-person uh, shooter game. Now, Dark Forces is probably in a lot of people's top 10 or top 15 FPS games from back in the day. Now, we're going to go through the list here, and to go back to what I was saying, if Dream is a love letter to LucasArts, then this project needed to be a love letter as well. So, this is a lot more than just these games running in an emulator. Uh, as we, every game here has every piece of art we can find for it. So I can go to view. Right now we're in boxes. Every game I can find a 3D box for or create one for has one at this point. Uh, these that don't have one. This one here was released in a CD sleeve. Star Wars Behind the Magic, Star Wars Making Magic, and Episode 1 Insider's Guide were all add-on CDs that were packed with other things. Sometimes they came with magazines. Sometimes they were a bonus disc inside of a game you bought. Um, Mortimer is a special one in that it did have a full-size commercial box, but nobody seems to have scans that are high quality of it. So this one, I'm sure, will be filled in over time. But every other game that we could find one for, we've and we even made one for Yoda Stories because they didn't have one before. Yeah, we can go down here and we can go to carts, and you'll see every single game has its original disc here. We can go to... Clear logos, and we uh, have all the clear logos so far, thanks to uh, one of our users. Of course, they all have screenshots. Looks like that's interesting. Yeah, it has a screenshot, it's just not showing it here. Sometimes if that happens, if you hit F5, there it is. I just had to hit F5. It, it had one. It just uh, 
didn't populate the first time. You'll notice right now it's playing music. Every game has at least a 30 second music loop. Now because so many of them are, <clears throat> excuse me, uh, Star Wars games, I did not just play the Star Wars theme over and over and over. You'll see that they each have music that is specific more to the game. Maybe from the first level of the game, maybe like uh, music from the menu system in the game. Now we're going to start up here and let's see here. If we jump to like Grim Fandango, for example, let me show you why this is a love letter and what I mean by that. When you right click a game and go to the extras, you will see a lot. These that have the cone I'm using VLC for, so those are movies. We have the making of Grim Fandango Remastered, all three parts that Double Fine filmed. The original trailer, we'll click on that. Now I haven't done this on this computer yet, so I may have to configure VLC. There it is. And if you were to start like, you know, eight inspirations for Grim Fandango, we get one of the documentaries that they've uploaded to YouTube. Grim Fandango was released 20 years ago in honor of Manny's 20th birthday. Uh, you'll find a lot of stuff like this. Uh, Loom has a really cool documentary that we've attached to it. Um, Welcome to the age of the see. great guilds. We also have, you know, the inlays. Uh, just a lot of the stuff you're going to find in Exodus, but you're going to find a lot more in here too. You'll see that we have the reworked MIDI soundtrack, the regular MIDI soundtrack, and the FM Town soundtrack. And if I click on that, it's going to kick over here to Fubar. There you go. This is the Japanese FM Towns release of the game. We have the overture, the main theme. So this one does include soundtracks as well. I'm going to go and hit pause on the music there so it's not interrupting us. Over on Monkey Island, I... Oh, I see. I hit the switch button. If you hit the switch button, this is true for all Exodus releases in the launch box. You can see the back of the box by clicking Welcome the flip button. To the age of the great we're going to have a secret of Monkey Island, though. I had to include this because it is one of my favorite. Retro Ahoy, the secret of Monkey Island. Retro Ahoy is a YouTube channel. Uh, Ahoy himself is probably my favorite YouTuber. He does very in-depth breakdowns of generally games but he'll even though this is ostensibly a video about the secret of monkey island it's an hour long and it talks about the state of gaming up until the point of monkey island why was it revolutionary when it came out what impact did it have going forward uh he's got a great soothing voice he really creates amazing content i always look forward to his videos when they come out um so I highly encourage you to check out his channel and hopefully downloading his video and putting it in the pack offsets any views that might be stolen from him by pushing a lot more people to his channel and to see his other content he has. Um, we have all the design documents in here for the game that came out back when uh, the Video Game History Foundation interviewed uh, Dave Gilbert about the game and he released a lot of cool documentation at the time. It talks about like the original game idea was called Mutiny on Monkey Island. Now when you actually start one of these games up, let's go like to Maniac Mansion for example. Pick that one because it's nice and small so it won't take long to unzip. We have two global settings, windowed mode and aspect correction. We're gonna leave those alone and you'll see when it starts up we have a little menu system. Once you're in the inside dream, you can hit Alt U or F12 and that'll let you change all your settings. Uh, I'll show you that when we get there, but that's how you're gonna pick your uh, sound card type you want or VGA versus EGA, all that kind of stuff. Now the main menu here is gonna show any version that is available for English right now. So there's a floppy DOS version and then there was an, a later enhanced version. There's also in other languages. If we hit that, this game has French, German, Italian, and Spanish. Let's go to German here. If there are more than one German game, uh, choices to pick from, it will then list them at that point. Now we're in here, I'm gonna go ahead and uh, hit F12. And you can see we have a graphics configuration. I can choose MCGA, VGA, 
EGA, Tandy, CGA, or Hercules. Now it's only going to show options that this game supports, so you don't have to worry about picking the wrong thing. And if we go to sound, this supports PC speaker or Tandy. Later games clearly are going to have Roland MT32, Sound Canvas, General MIDI. You're going to have a lot of options as the games uh, progress in time. Uh, we can also exit from here. Um, you can look at your game data. That takes you to the folder that it's playing the game from. Now we're going to hit exit. And let's jump over to a more recent game, hopefully one that takes long to install. Go to uh, Dark Forces here. Now they do take a little bit of time because um, we're talking about CD-ROMs for multiple games. So we have the CD in English and other languages. Other languages we have French, German, Italian, Japanese, Korean, and Spanish. And those are all already included, ready to go. Let's see what Korean is like for Dark Forces. How's that sound? So far, we're not in Korean yet. <laughs> Maybe the voice as well. Once we get to the... Uh... So it's here, uh, the secret base. I think this is the right button. So no voiceovers in the Korean version. You have to read everything. Other than that, same. Go ahead and F12 and exit that. Now here's where it gets really, really cool. That menu that it's showing you and it's saying what languages you have options. That is not a hard-coded menu. I've come up with a method in which you can come over here to, here's the folders we've installed, and it is scanning this right here. Just like it scans this. The menu is based on these folder names. If I created a new menu in here, and I called it um, fake, then I can actually go over to Maniac Manage. I can start it. And you'll see fake is now on the menu. So it, I, clearly it's not going to work. There's no game in there right now. But if I were to put game files in there, I could name them exactly what I want it to be. You know, maybe they pretend there was a CD version. I drop those files in there, and now it's going to launch that, and it's going to work. Uh, the same is true for other languages. I can add a folder for every language, and then underneath that folder, I can put the type I have in there. Now, when we picked German on that, we did not see Floppy Enhanced version 1.01 because it seemed a little extraneous to display a whole menu to pick one version of the game. So I've designed it so that if there is only one option, then it skips the final menu and just launches it completely. So for example, under Dark Forces, if there were no other languages and this folder did not exist, then it's not going to present a, a menu and ask you if you want to play the CD version. It's going to say, well, there's only one version. So when you double click to start that game, that's what it's going to play. I believe that is true for Shadows of the Empire. You can see there's only a CD folder here. So if you install that game and play it, you don't get a menu system on that one. Now, I will say Shadows of the Empire is a very unique game in that it was uh, designed to be a multimedia plug-in to the Star Wars universe. They came up with this to promote the George Lucas special edition releases of the original trilogy. Uh, it was a weird media blitz. So if we go in here, you can see that there was a commercial for the book. They read it, and the book's in here too. Uh, Shadows of the Empire novel by Steve Perry. There was a commercial for the game, which clearly this is what that is. There was a commercial for a toy line they made based on it. They also made an entire comic book series, and we've put that in here. There is uh, Shadows of the Empire Omnibus. There is a novel companion. They made a role-playing book uh, for, you know, like a D&D style role-playing game. And then there was also The Secrets of Star Wars Shadows of the Empire book, which talks about how this book plugs into the overall mythology. So basically, Lucas got together and said, Lucasfilm got together, LucasArts got together and said, well, we want a Star Wars movie to make people excited about Star Wars again, but we don't want to make a movie. 
So let's make everything as if there was a movie. And toys and a game. They released an official soundtrack. And that's what that is right there. They released everything as if um, there was a movie, but there never was. So the game itself and the book, they're the movie. Uh, so it's kind of like a lost uh, official Star Wars movie, or at least it was prior to Disney buying. Now that Disney bought them, I don't know if they, they probably threw it out as extended universe. Prepare yourself for Star Wars. Shadows of the Empire. The evil empire has struck back with a vengeance. And a new villain, the crime lord Shizor, schemes to replace Darth Vader as the Emperor's second in command. With Han Solo held frozen in carbonite by bounty hunter Boba Fett, it's the rebellion's darkest hour. Now, join Jedi warrior Luke Skywalker, hard charging Chewbacca, and go undercover with heroic pilot Dash Rendar and his booming out charging Chewbacca and go undercover. Why does Chewbacca have a flat top? <laughs> and his cyborg guy. <laughs> I don't know how many of you played Sega Genesis type games growing up or, or at any point in your life, but there was a game called Eternal Champions. This looks like a cross between a guy named Rax, who was like a cybernetic kickboxer, and then a dude named Blade, who was this big like like boxing police officer from the future, if I remember correctly. It looks like they took those two characters and just spliced them right together to make this. That's so silly. Uh, oh my gosh, I'm glad I saw that. That's funny. There's some classics in here, too. I mean, TIE Fighter and um, X-Wing are both astounding games. Now, you'll see the cover here says the Collector CD-ROM edition. However, it does include the original floppy versions, too, on both of those games. Uh, they are some of the last games to use the iMuse system. iMuse was a technology that LucasArts came up with where there was dynamic music track switching depending on the scene you were walking through, rather than having a pre-canned music that played in each scene. Um, Yoda Story is kind of like a roguelike. It's a procedurally generated game, as is its precursor, which was in a Jones desktop adventures. Uh, they're neat. They're little five, ten minute games. Uh, I never beat them as a kid. They were always kind of hard. Uh, but you wander around, you find items, you talk to people. It's just a little adventure game that makes stuff up real quick. Imagine if Minesweeper or Solitaire was an adventure game, and that's what you get there. Really neat stuff to play with. Mortimer and the Riddles of the Medallion was an educational game that I was not familiar with before this. Um, it looks interesting to me. It looks like you ride around on a snail and you learn. That's all I know so far about it. <laughs> uh, of course, you had Outlaws, which is kind of a weird Western FPS game that used early cell shading before it was really common. Uh, You know, it looks it looks really similar to like the old build engine games, the the really like stark, the repetitive wall textures, the stark walls. It's hard to believe this is a commercial game. Looking at that picture, that looks very shareware to me. Uh, yeah, Jedi Knight, which was actually Dark Forces Two, uh, something that I had forgotten about over time. But then they went and made the add-on pack, Mysteries of the Sith. These were full 3D games, uh, and, like polygonal characters. Whereas Dark Forces was a was more like Doom and Duke Nukem 3D, and that you have 3D backgrounds, but the characters yourself they're all sprites on a 3D background. Let's see what else we got here. Of course, there's uh, the original one. I'm not gonna go over like Zack and Sam and Max and Monkey Island because these are games that have been in Exodos and Exoscum VM for a long time now. Same with Loom. It is nice to see um, Escape Monkey Island, which we have the wrong screen there. That's one of the bugs I need to get fixed. But the game itself is all 3D. It tries to... I think it uses the same engine as Grim Fandango. It's the only Monkey Island game I've never played. Uh, so maybe this will finally afford me the chance to do it. I love the music. Uh, just like the other EXO packs, when you install the game, it will show up on the installed list. Um, you'll see here, this is one of my bugs, and I should have fixed it before making the video. Uh, on the current release, it does say Exoscum VM Games instead of Exo Dream Games. Now, there's a quick fix for this. You just hit Edit and you change that to Dream. And we're just going to copy that and paste it. And then I'm going to go to Auto Populate and I'm going to change. I'm going to go ahead and uh, delete that one. And I'm going to change this to Dream. Then I'm going to click OK. And now it works. So that is something that we fixed. Uh, it was a weird error. I fixed it before release, and then there was a regression. 
and it showed up and that's always so frustrating to get to the point where you've made the torrent you've released it out there and then 48 hours later someone says by the way it's like darn it you know now i gotta go in and repack the whole thing and re-release it so i decided to go ahead and just wait on the first update to do that uh aaron does have a new version of dream coming out in the near future uh early this early 2024 is the timeline that i'm aware of currently it's going to add several games, like I said earlier, a lot of the flight simulators and such. So at that time, um, is a good time to get all those fixes out there. So it'll only be this way for a month or two. Um, I'm really excited about Dream. I, it plays games from the 9X era really well. And like the Infernal Machine actually runs on here, and that's a 9X game. Um, now the way it runs it, it is mimicking a Windows environment on the back end but not a full one. It just mimics enough APIs for the game to run. That's a really unique approach to me because one of the big issues of a 9X emulation has been the emulation of the overall package of the operating system. If there is a possible way of creating a backend that strips 9X down to just the bare components that a game needs to run, and we're not really booting a machine into Windows, we're booting the game and it's just calling the APIs, that's a really unique way of handling the problem now the pro is everything i just listed the con is every game is going to have different calls for the most part i mean a handful of games might use the same ones but you know it's not like dosbox where you build the machine and then you run games on it in this case you are building the api calls uh, to the windows backend as the game needs it which you know is not a uh, solid solution for a very long-term project that's designed to handle all linux games but I think that there's some interesting ideas there that could be leveraged. Uh, we'll see. Over time, we'll tell. Aaron has said he has lots of interesting ideas for this back end. One complaint I've seen people leverage at him is that it is a, not an open source program. It is closed source. However, it's his work. He created it. We're not entitled to it. Just because someone's creating things that they share with the community doesn't mean that we as a community have the right to claim, okay, now give me your source. That's not how, I mean... There's, it's weird when I see that argument because it does come across as a sense of entitlement to me. Is it not good enough that he's creating something that helps these games play better than they ever did before using the original file format? Um, the idea that something has to be open source to uh, be acceptable is, I think, short-sighted. Um, it's the same way when I see people make comments about piracy and like, well, EXO and all his projects are they're based on piracy. I think that is short-sighted because the only legal way to buy a lot of these games is through a stripped, ripped up format that it's not the original game. And um, so to take a hardline stance on it and to be very holier than thou about it ignores the fact that there is not a good legal solution. Anyway, I am looking forward to Exo Dream version 2. Uh, we will probably start using the version release numbers of Dream to keep it non-confusing. Uh, we have two point. 1.2 is the current version we're running so i think 2.2 or maybe it was 2.21 is what we're using and 2.3 is going to be the next one if i remember correctly so exo dream 2.3 will release very shortly if not simultaneously to the full release of dream 2.3 uh aaron has been an amazing partner to work with on this i say partner because he's helped me out but it's his project i'm not please don't confuse me for saying that i've partnered with him in any way to contribute to his side of things He's just been a great partner helping me out getting a front end built for his work and uh, working with me to add command line options to Dream and to uh, iron out a ton of bugs that I found while I was setting things up. And that's not to say that it's just because I'm the first person to come along and set up every game to use it. So inherently, I'm going to uncover things that other people who have only played a handful of games never came across. Um, it's a great partner partnership in my opinion and it's really nice to work with someone who is excited and helpful um so I, I, as much respect as i have for scum vm the overall project has felt ambivalent at times and even um hostile at times now i have met several individual scum vm developers that are amazing people very kind very generous confused by the overall attitude of the scum vm project but that's to be expected when you have a project that has dozens of people that are contributing to it. There's no way that all those people are bad people. I would hazard to guess that pretty much every developer for Scumbeam is a great person. I think that one 
or two, the people who have been around a long time that run the whole thing have allowed the idea of, um, you know, pirated games to infest their forums. And it has created a hostile environment for anyone looking to make a project like this for them. The irony in that is they rely on our projects. They're not, a, you can't tell me that everyone who's a developer for Scum VM has a legitimate copy of, um, you know, Secret of Monkey Island for FM Towns. That's incredibly expensive, like four or $500 expensive. And I know that they rely on projects like this to get dumped copies of those games so they can test them. So the, you know, it's a little disingenuous for them to claim that uh, they don't support piracy in any way when they're using piracy to develop their games, uh, their backends. Um, but this project, this, this video is not about them. It's about the fact that Aaron has been a great partner and someone that I can work with. And we're not dealing with all those shenanigans. It's really just about the games. It's about preservation. It's about a love letter to a company that changed the gaming marketplace with their with their games. They Cinemaware wanted to be like movie based games. LucasArts was movie based games. They felt like movies. The Dig is like a Steven Spielberg movie that never got made. Shadows of the Empire is a Star Wars movie that never got made. Full Throttle feels like a movie when you're playing it. You know, Day of the Tentacle, while not cinematic, has a really good story that could be easily written into a children's book or even a novel. Um, Curse of Manicay Island is still, to my, to this day, probably one of the most gorgeously animated games, in my opinion. Just stunning. It really is. If you've never played Curse of Monkey Island, that's what you should be doing right now. You need to stop watching my video, and you need to go play this game. Uh, these are compressed images. They look better in the game. Uh, the voice work is spectacular in this game. The puzzles are difficult, but fair, um, for the most part. There is an easy mode, though. If you pick the devious mode, you're going to be prepared to have some really crazy puzzles. Uh, it's a great game. It's got an amazing sense of humor. This little floating skull, Murray. Uh, I've laughed out loud more than once playing the game with him. What a great game. And it's funny to me that Dave Gilbert disowns it because it's the Monkey Island he didn't make. And that has led to a bad taste for many people who are fans of the series. Because to them, only the first few games are legit. Which is a shame, because I think 3 is amazing. Not, I'm not saying it's better than 1 or 2, but I'm saying from an animation standpoint it is. Uh, but it is on par, I think, at least from a story perspective. I think Dave Gilbert got a little bit too caught up with himself trying to make a crazy ending for Monkey Island 2. And it put off a lot of people, in my opinion. It didn't wrap things up. It was kind of zany for the sake of being zany. 3 does a damn good job of taking the weird ending and somehow rolling forward with it, but still maintaining the believability that this is a really pirate off on a pirate island and not some... Well, I don't want to spoil the ending to Monkey Island 2, but if you've ever played it, it is a strange ending. And so the fact that 3 can pick up and actually make sense is pretty impressive. I hope you guys enjoy Exodream. It's a really great project. I'm glad to have been. I'm, I'm glad that my project is contributing towards eyes on it. Um, Burrito seventy eight is a member of the Dream community and the Exodus community. I owe a lot to him. He got a lot of these spe specifically the foreign language games. Uh, I owe it to him. He hunted these to, to the files down. He hunted a lot of it down and provided it to me. Exo Dream I was able to put together in about two weeks because I had so much support from Aaron on the emulator side and then guys like Burrito78 over on the file side providing me what I needed and I was able to just work and I wasn't stuck hunting random stuff down. I wasn't stuck trying to squash bugs myself. It was uh, very refreshing and it was a great break after Exodus version 6 that was such a slog to get through at the end to turn around and knock something out of this magnitude that quickly. Um, so again, I hope you enjoy it. I know I did creating it. Uh, I still like to fire it up and uh, play around with it. And that menu system that uh, I showed earlier where you can drag and drop games into it and it auto populates. Um, while that to a programmer, that is probably pretty basic stuff. I always say I'm not a programmer and that's all done in batch code. So I can now take that and I can put it into places like Exodus version six, where uh, the shaders, for example, it can now create a dynamic menu of shaders and it doesn't matter how many you add or take away, they'll show up on the menu. 
Now that menu has error correcting built into it too. If you type in a number that doesn't exist on that menu, it won't allow it. If you type in a value that is not a number, it won't allow it. If you type in a number that is higher than the highest number, it won't allow it, or lower than the lowest number. It error checks everything to make it a very user-friendly experience so that you don't accidentally type in the wrong thing or fat finger something and find yourself um, stuck trying to exit and relaunch or, you know, it's a really neat system. I'm really proud of it. And I'm looking forward to how I can put it to use in my other projects so I can get away from hard-coded menus. Hard-coded menus are a pain. I'm going to try to take it to my Scum VM project and make it so that instead of having a hard-coded menu for every game that says, here's all the versions we have, and you click on that, pick the next thing, if I can do it the same way using folders instead, uh, then adding games to Scum VM is as simple as adding a folder and making sure that the index file has the right, proper game tag for that folder. Instead of having to then do those things and then go and add, edit a batch file that keeps getting longer and more complex, um, it's just another point of potential breakdown. With that, I'll wrap up the video. Happy holidays. I hope everyone is safe with family or friends. Um, if you find yourself lonely this holiday season, come over to the Discord and talk. We'll be around. Uh, I consider everyone there to be a, like a second family to me. And we are very welcoming to anybody who want to just chat about games. That's my favorite thing about my Discord is it's a place for people with like-minded interests to just chat. So please, if you ever find yourself lonely at all this holiday season, pop in, say hi. And um, there's a good chance I'll be there. And if not me, I've got some really cool guys hanging out there too. And uh, we'd be more than happy to have you. Take care.